everybody. Welcome so much. Thank you for joining us to Data and Society's public panel for our Trust Issues Academic Workshop called What's Trust Got to Do With It? I'm Sarita Amrute. I'm the director of the Trustworthy Infrastructures Program here at Data and Society, and I'll be your host with the support, support of Tanika Onekikami and R Rigoberta Lara Guzman from the events team. For those joining Data and Society for the first time, we are an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. This year, Data and Society turns 10, and I'm excited to be celebrating the anniversary with this event. You can learn more about what we've accomplished and where we're headed on our website, dataandsociety.com. Net. Actually, it's datasociety.net, no and. Um, so today's discussion, what's trust got to do with it, takes on the pressing question of how communities of color and other minoritized communities conceptualize trust and technology. Our panelists will talk us through how AI systems and other data-centric technologies come to trust and distrust us, and how in turn members of different communities come to find trustworthy information online. We will ask, we will also talk about what it means to be a researcher and a practitioner working to understand the institutional and relational politics of technologies and what it means to be asked to speak to and for communities of color. During our discussion, we'll use the chat function to post links and ask you to share your experiences. To ask or upvote questions for us, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We've set aside time to address those too. Our guests today are Chelsea Peterson Salahuddin, Irene Suleiman, and Jason DeCruz. Chelsea Peterson Salahuddin is a president's postdoctoral fellow and incoming assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Information, her research focuses on the culturally specific ways marginalized communities, most often Black women, femmes, and queer folks, engage with mass and digital communications technologies to seek information, produce knowledge, and build community, and how the infrastructures of these technologies helps these communities to overcome or continue to replicate systemic barriers to equity. Irene Suleiman is an AI safety and policy expert and head of global policy at Hugging Face, where she is conducting social impact research and leading public policy. Irene serves on the Partnership for, on AI's Policy Steering Committee and the Center for Democratic Technologies AI Governance Lab Advisory Committee. Jason DeCruz is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Albany, SUNY, and the principal investigator of trustworthiness from a user perspective, a multi-year project supported by the SUNY IBM Research Alliance. He is also the faculty advisor for the University of Albany's Minorities and Philosophies chapter. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for being here today. So I'm gonna throw out the first very broad question for all of you, which is how do trust and mistrust show up in your work? Chelsea, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, so a lot of my work is specifically looking at the ways that women of color and Black women um, are discerning trust in information. And that can be news information specifically, um, and it can also be information broadly. And I'm really trying to think about well, what are the things that signal to them that either this source of information or this information generally can or cannot be trusted. And often that is really rooted in their own lived experiences um, and in how well they trust that an institution or a technology or a corporation that owns a technology is really thinking about their needs and their lived experiences and the way they are living and walking through and perceiving the world and whether that's being reflected in that information. So I think that's kind of the key way that it continually um, is showing up in the work that I'm doing um, and really trying to understand um, kind of what are the ways in which institutions or technologies 
um, are really not living up to kind of the standards of trust that communities of color, specifically women of color and black mm -hmm. women have, um, the ways in which distrust has fostered historically over time. Um, and what is it that these institutions really need to be thinking about and doing to build trust in these communities? Um, kind of not just as a, we want you to trust us, so we are going to, you know, do something that kind of feels very surface level, but continually build trust and rebuild trust over time. Mm, thank you so much, Chelsea. I'm going to pass to Irene, because I think Irene might have some ideas about what institutions need to start doing to do a better job on building trust. I have many ideas, and I also want to hugely emphasize the what Chelsea was saying around information. And just to give some background, I come from more of a generative AI background. And when we're thinking about trust, we're thinking about it in levels of information and outputs, including with what generative AI systems are able to generate, human or AI generated. I've worked on these systems for a very, like as long as most people can. Um, and I can't tell the difference. Like throwback to Pope Balenciaga completely got me. And especially for what's particularly affecting women of color, but affects everybody, affects women, and particularly women of color is, is NCII, is non-consensual intimate imagery. And I think that just needs a lot more attention. So there's there's information and outputs. There's the system level of trust. How much do we uh, trust systems to reliably give us accurate information or you know not harmful information? And then to your point, Sarita, around institutions, we uh, I'm in a very interesting spot at, at Hugging Face. So kind of think GitHub of AI, where we host many types of models, artifacts, components of systems, and all of the considerations that come with being part of a platform, including trust among contributors and users, uh, trust that comes with having user accounts and protecting private information. Uh, there's there's many, many layers, at least in the AI world. For those who don't know, can you just tell us quickly what Hugging Face is? Yeah, so kind of think GitHub of AI. So we're a repository and a space for a community, really, of open source and open science uh, with a mission to democratize good machine learning. So we have, we're really the power of a global community who are contributing to data sets, models, uh, these kinds of spaces to make sure that AI is working best for everybody. And Jason, you have a little bit of a different perspective. I'd love to hear from you about trust and mistrust in your work. I think you might be on mute. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so thanks, Anita. There's so there's a lot of discussion about trustworthy AI, and it's become kind of a buzzword um, about what are the features, uh, characteristics of an AI system that would make it uh, fitting for and safe for humans to trust it. And I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective, thinking about um, the use of AI to make determinations of human trustworthiness. So it seems like we're coming to a point where um, there are more and more um, decisions about or forecasts of um, people's likelihood to do things like uh, repay a loan or to cheat on a test or to show up for a bail hearing um, that are being powered by machine learning and that um, and these systems are getting better and better at forecasting behavior. Um, but forecasting behavior and assessing human trustworthiness are two different things. And um, so one thing that we're really trying to and work so with a group um, that we're really trying to emphasize is that trust, human trustworthiness is a matter of having certain kinds of distinctive motivations, reasons for your action um, that don't always show up in behavior. So um, how a person behaves is often a function of the opportunities that they have, the environment in which they're um, living. And um, we want to have to, we have to understand these things in order to understand what their reasons and their motivations are. And so even if we get better at forecasting behavior, we do not ipso facto get better at assessing human trustworthiness. And so it's kind of a call for some caution um, as we move towards a society where more and more opportunities are afforded on the basis of risk assessments and risk scores, um, that just because we're getting better at forecasting behavior doesn't mean that we're getting better at understanding or assessing human trustworthiness. And I see a lot of nods. So Chelsea, do you want to come in there? Um, yeah, so I yeah, I do think that um, 
there is a distinction between, I think, what we can surface level see as somebody's behaviors and whether or not they're discerning trust, right? Um, so a lot of women of color, Black women I speak to, right, they may be certain technologies, there may be certain news institutions that they go to for news, right? That's their behavior. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're always trusting the information that they're getting from these sources, right? I think what they do is they develop um, tactics, they develop critical lenses through which they then filter their information. So kind of similarly to what Jason was saying, right? There's a difference, I think, between behaviors and how people move throughout the world, almost sometimes out of necessity, right? Thinking about, um, as you were saying, opportunities can dictate behavior, right? What is available can dictate behavior. But that's very different than having a trust in that technology or trust in that institution or building on that trust, right? And I think it would be um, a grave mistake in thinking about how to build trust and maybe even correct for distrust that has been built within, you know, communities of color to say just because a behavior shows that they are interacting with us means that they trust us. Right. I think those are two distinct mm. uh, things that you're pointing to that I think that's why I was nodding, because I think I see a, a very similar thing. And to kind of conflate the two, I think, would be a mistake. So interaction does not equal trust. And I think that's really important. So in a way, we're getting at this, these two sides of this complex relationship between technologies, communities, and trusts. One, in terms of how trust systems are trained and taught to mistrust certain kinds of bodies, certain kinds of peoples. And then the long histories of institutionalized trust and distrust that uh, that come from communities vis-a-vis -vis systems or vis-a-vis -vis institutions. Um, Irene, I'm wondering in terms of the work you do with Hugging Face and specifically around auditing and understanding AI, how do you think about the ways in which communities can evaluate these systems or how the system should be built to be evaluated? Sarita, I just came from a group working session. I'm leading an incredible group with Xerox a lot of people across institutions, especially early career researchers. And uh, we're looking at the social impact of AI. So an aspect of safety that looks beyond not just representational harms and biases, but also financial costs, privacy. A lot of what we found has been underrepresented in a lot of safety conversations for AI. And um, I, have a, I have a few rants here, but working with people who aren't um, always plugged into the highest level policy conversations, but have this incredible insight into the state of the field and the state of evaluations is one really concerning that we have a pretty comprehensive guide that will be published soon, soon I need to finish writing it. Um, but also concerning at, at how little attention and investment has been put into the social impact side of evaluating AI. And part of that, this is not to blame anybody, is that it's really, really hard to do. It's really hard to quantify characteristics that just like inherently should not be quantified. And we as a group have rightfully gotten pushback on why are you even doing evaluations? Why are you taking this engineering approach into examining models? Um, and, I, and I think that's that's a, the right feedback. And it's also what what is the right way to do it? And how do we, uh, my approach to evaluations is every evaluation is just a window into a model. And you can poke a lot of holes and you can kind of have like a peppered insight into many different dimensions of a model. So throwing a lot of evaluations, but quantitative alone cannot give you a holistic, robust understanding of not just a model, but a system. So not just that model, but its data sets and its many components. I would love to hear an example of a a kind of evaluation that moves beyond the quantitative and what kind of work that can do if you have one. So um, it's been a while since I've been able to run them myself. I used to, uh, and the, the state of evaluations has greatly changed. So, um, but maybe not enough. There's a lot of investment in, for example, natural language processing and language models in, in academia around bias. But I also see this investment looking different across different sectors. So we've seen a lot of layoffs, uh, for example, around AI ethics. I'm very glad to work at Hugging Face where we really prioritize these types of concerns. Um, and, an example of something that's like vibes are co-occurrence co metrics. So you'll have a, uh, 
a lot of times representational harms will look at protected classes, and this is relying on existing frameworks. So you'll look at US Equal Opportunity Law, UN Declaration for Human Rights, and then you'll say, okay, let's look at gender, and then let's see what the associations are with, and, and language has markers with these pronouns, with these markers for gender. And this is where it looks really different by modality. So this is what's really hard to do for image, for example, is like, what is a representation of a gender? And then this looks really different as we get into other uh, protected classes that maybe don't have as clear like pronoun markers. Uh, but a co-occurrence metric, for example, will not be quantitative and will say like she, her pronouns, uh, woman will associate with like motherhood um, instead of like professions, for example. Mm -hmm. That's really, really clear. That's a clear example. I think we've all been in the case where we've look for an image of a doctor and have not seen ourselves represented, for instance, in that way. Um, Jason, I wonder if you think about examples like that when it comes to the way that systems don't trust us to represent ourselves accurately, maybe, or in a way that the system determines to be truthful. Yeah, so I, I kind of worry quite a lot about um, the trustworthiness of members of minoritized or marginalized communities, that trustworthiness of being legible to AI systems, um, and also just the pressure to make oneself legible to AI systems. So these systems are trained up on data, often disproportionately from dominant groups. And then there are certain things about um, uh, minoritized groups that are going to be just less legible. I mean, here's kind of uh, I think an example that is um, sort of um, recognizable um, there. So voice recognition technology has really increased uh, in uh, its quality an enormous amount, but it has increased um, much less fast for people who speak African-American English than for, for people who um, speak white American English. Um, so um, African-American English is much uh, poor understood by these voice recognition systems. Um, and that's, you know, for the obvious reason that the systems have been trained up on voices that are white and um, not voices that are black. Um, but then there's kind of subtle pressure to, in order to be understood by these systems, um, to sound more white right, um, to make yourself conform to the dominant, um, uh, to the dominant group. And I think we might find that across a lot of different domains where in order to be seen, to be heard, to be understood by these systems that are trained up on data from dominant groups, um, there's going to be the subtle pressure to um, behave more like uh, members of those dominant groups. And I worry that we're just kind of going to miss that or not, we're not going to be, we're not going to perceive it. Um, and um, there's going to be this kind of subtle motivation um, to conform in order to be legible. And that is a very old problem, right? The way in which minoritized uh, or oppressed communities are disciplined into a certain way of performing the self or a certain kind of knowledge. Chelsea, this really this discussion really reminds me of your work and the uh, women, femmes, queer folk you talk to. Uh, maybe you could take us through some of the ways they they play with those demands to conform. Yeah, um, I think in the way that at least the the people that I have talked to for, for the work that I do, um, I honestly think that there is, for the most part, um, a, a resistance to conform in a lot of these spaces. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think this what this conversation brought up for me um, is something that I have been working on recently, where I have been kind of talking to a lot of uh, Black women and femme identified folks. Um, in the area about kind of their use of, of digital platforms and, and, and information seeking. Um, and I think one thing that has come up a lot specifically for them is this issue of not seeing themselves represented, right? So not when you, you know, Google an image of a, a 
a doctor, right? It not only not being a woman, but then not being a black woman, right? Um, and I think that there is this understanding that they are not being made legible in this system and a frustration around it. I it doesn't necessarily it, it, I think it marks that system in some way for them that I, mm -hmm. you do not see me and therefore we have something of an antagonistic relationship. Even if, again, going back to the behavior thing, I may still use this system, right? Um, there is this negative and feeling and frustration with said system, Um so I, I think that is kind of the way I've seen it shown up. I, I think I feel a lot of people feeling like there is a push for them to conform in certain spaces and almost like an, an active resistance or a frustration around having to do that in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chelsea, I mean, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, please. You, please. You mind if I, uh, you're the host. <laughs> but, so what well, Chelsea says is interesting to me and it kind of just made me think about, you know, whether you think there's a kind of double bind where, so on the one hand, there's this um, desire to resist, not to conform in order to be legible. So, you know, just, you know, be who you are and, um, don't try to change yourself to be legible to the system. But if you take that path, there are certain ways in which you are punished for doing that, right? Um, it's like, you know, the person who, um, you know, wants to reject the the entire credit system and decides, like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to buy into that. I'm not going to have a credit card at all. Um, and if you take that route, which you can, and that is a form of resistance, there's a price that you pay for it. And I'm wondering if, like, do you see that as a double bind? Um, do you see people negotiating that kind of a double bind? Yeah, I think I see it as like a known risk, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the thought process behind it being um, d situation dependent, like what am I willing to risk, right? Um, so I think when thinking about technology usage or, you know, not seeing yourself represented in kind of news um, or in, in other kind of information sources, there is this like, um, I could get punished for this. I may have a negative feeling when I know I'm going to search this thing and I'm not seeing myself represented. At the same time, I think the, in this context, information and these systems that deliver information have become so ubiquitously important, right? That there's, um, there's a feeling that you have to be there, be present and maybe contend with some of those risks. And I do think that colors your experience of them. No, I don't know if that would necessarily extend to everything, right? As you, you gave the example of like a credit score, right? So yeah. do I risk not having a home Right. I think that's a very different question. And so I think it's it it depends on the system we're contending with. I do think that sometimes people in certain online spaces know that if they are going to be resistant in a certain way, they may be punished for it, either by other people on that platform, either by the technology in the platform it, itself, right? Um, by the institution itself. Um, and I think for some people, being able to exist as they are is kind of worth that risk in that specific space. But I do agree that I think it can be situation technology risk dependent, right? Like what is that risk that you're taking? And I think there is, but I, I think more to the point, there's an awareness that those things are happening. Mm -hmm. Irene, did you, I saw you nodding along too. I'm not sure if you wanted to come in on this conversation. There are so many points that I want to follow up on, especially just huge plus one to, to Jason's points. I think a lot about what constitutes goodness as uh, in coordinates with what is well-resourced. Um, and I think about this a lot with the availability of data on which we train, uh, particularly why are language models so highest performing in English? And what does that mean when we deploy them? And why is it so important to work with communities on consensual data sourcing and ensure that it represents their dialects and that dialects are respected as dialects, uh, which you know has not always been the case for AAVE, for example. Um, I have, I, have so, I have so many more thoughts. I also just want to emphasize the importance of uh, cross-sectoral discourse where 
a big part of my job uh, is is communicating with policymakers, and part of why I just adore working with this group of varying levels of experience uh, working on social impact evals is that not everybody will have a lobbying department. I have I'm very lucky. I have I'm pretty well resourced, um, but there's so many people with all of these incredible insights uh, who are plugged into different areas of understanding systems that maybe aren't always aligned with industry incentives. And that's where, that's just what we need to be listening to as well. That's a really great, great point. And it, it kind of brings up for me a question of how we each sit within our respective institutions. Um, in terms of the kinds of power relationships that we as researchers and practitioners are trying to navigate. So, you know, to the point that not everyone has a lobbying group, um, sometimes I think we can we can function as a node or a condensation point to voice those concerns. But I wonder how each of you in your own institutional locations thinks about your positionality. Um, what kinds of conversations can you forward and enact, which which kinds of confidences or trusted relationships um, need to be talked about in a different space? How how do you navigate those those complexities? I'm gonna ask Jason maybe Jason to take us there. Sure. I mean, one thing that sort of came to mind was that um there needs to be shared and so in any kind of um intimate interaction or sharing, there needs to be shared understanding about um, what sorts of things are to be kept private and what sorts of things are um, are free to share with other people. And there's not always that mutual understanding between parties to a conversation. And that can lead to, you know, lots of misunderstandings. And I think we too often kind of assume that we already know what another person's boundaries are about what they're willing to share about what they would prefer to keep private um and it really makes sense to make the extra effort to um just be a little bit more epistemically humble about what you know about the other person's preferences and needs and just ask them um explicitly about what is for private consumption um what their um willing to share a really obvious point but I think one that kind of bears repeating yeah and Jason has a really good article called humble trust which kind of gets into exploring how humility is such such an important thing to building trust um Chelsea yeah so I think the way I approach it is um when I am you know talking to people um when I am talking to black women women of color um I come to it with the understanding that you are placing a certain amount of trust in me. Um, that trust may not necessarily extend to the institution I am in. Um, it may not extend to everyone I am communicating with. And I think I have to take that very seriously. Um, so like, kind of like Jason was saying, I often give a disclaimer that if there is anything that you would not feel comfortable, you know, people knowing generally, please do not feel obligated to tell me. Um, but I think even more than that, right, I see it as um, to the best of my ability to kind of communicate um, kind of where institutions, technology systems, can um, do things to continually help build trust without kind of being explicit about kind of in community conversations, very specific markers of trust, very uh, specific things that people do within a community to gain trust, right? I think that there is a lot of reflection and discernment in that, right? I understand that I have to be um, very careful. And even if somebody did tell me something, even with the disclaimer, you don't have to tell me everything, you know, will making this thing public in this other space, that is not the kind of, um, kind of private and trusted space that I've at least tried to create when talking to people, when I take that into another space, right? Do I risk betraying that trust, right? That's something I think I constantly have to ask myself. Um, and even I think for me, if, the answer is maybe, then it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that my role is to be 
um, kind of, as you said, like a, a kind of a helpful note or a helpful voice in building trust and kind of giving away things that um, would almost kind of circumvent honestly building trust um, is just contributing to this continued issue of um, distrust from a lack of respect for that community, right? Mm -hmm. Or a, a lack of really considering the feelings of that community. Um, I do think it's tricky, but I think it is a thing to constantly be mindful of and reflective of um, kind of when I'm thinking about what I share, when and to who. I have a question uh, that I've been noodling on for a while is who represents a community? How, like how, what, what, do, what should engagement look like? And I think about this, for example, in terms of election disinformation, I can go to election, elected uh, officials. I can go to Congress. I can go to state senates. There's like a very structured place that I can go um, for teachers, for example, with homework outputs. There, like there's, there are communities. It's a little bit more difficult to access them and they're, they're distributed, which makes a lot of sense. But then we think about like marginalized communities what what should that look like from a respectful standpoint from industry? That's a really great question. I mean, a really out. difficult one. I mean, I think and obviously like there's there's like there can't be a simple answer to it. Um, but I mean, one thing to um, I think always keep in mind is that it's not always the case that the loudest voices from within the community are the representative voices um, of the community. And sometimes it's actually quite the opposite. And there are all sorts of like interesting internal politics within these communities. And I think we also have like a very strong tendency to um, uh, homogenize um, minoritized or marginalized communities and to kind of want to paper over um, individual differences or internal um um, disagreements uh, within the community. And so, I mean, those are just kind of, you know, guideposts for thinking about community engagement. One, always keep in mind that the loudest voices are not necessarily the, represent the representative ones. And two, that the communities are often highly uh, heterogeneous with internal conflicts and internal um, disagreements, just like any communities. There's as it's, it's it should be so obvious, but there's as much disagreement within minoritized communities as there is in with dominant dominant communities, and um, we often are, it's hard to be alive to that all the time. Yeah, and I think I would just kind of piggybacking on what Jason said. Um, I don't think that you can <laughs> fully represent a community. Um, I think. Oftentimes, even when I'm thinking about my work, I'm very specific to be like the people in this room in this study. Um, but I do think that um, kind of to the point about like these communities are not monolithic is that I think actually paying attention to the nuances within communities or even sub communities, right, um, is really important. Um, I think that, as you said, you I, I think that the nuances help us understand why any kind of like monolithic approach to representing, to building trust, right, is probably not going to work. Um, because even I speak specifically to women of color communities or Black women communities, and I feel like I'm always trying to point out, even within this community, I'm seeing different things. I'm seeing various perspectives. And all of the perspectives that can be there may and probably are not represented in this subgroup of people that I'm speaking to, right? And so I even think from the point of like, acknowledging that, that you can't represent a whole community, but then being mindful in that, like, what is the nuance and how do we think about less as communities broadly and more like small C communities together? Yeah. I mean, and maybe kind of a useful framing device is like not to think <laughs> about the merely like, what are the views of this community? We're going to try to come to some kind of distillation of uh, the views or the opinions of the entire community, but like, what are the important conversations that are going on within this community now? What mm -hmm. are the live disagreements? What are the points of contention um, within the community? And for that to be what our frame is or what our focus is, instead of coming to a distillation of, you know, what is the consensus in this community, mm -hmm. where often you know, there isn't a consensus. And maybe I'll just add something that I always find useful is thinking about representation, not as a portrait, but as a proxy. 
So uh, someone who's coming to speak at a st stakeholder meeting is there by proxy, which by definition means that what they're saying is incomplete. Um, it, it can't ever, one is a proxy meaning, one isn't the actual thing, um, rather than a picture, which can kind of a pretension to completeness. Um, and also I think something that's really important to think about is different communities have their own um, norms about who will be a proxy and sometimes the process should maybe take into that into account and leave space for those more internal discussions to take place um, before having a kind of participatory moment. Um, we have not that much time left, but I wanted to make sure before we turn to the Q&A that we talk a little bit about elections that are happening all over the world. Uh, many 2024 is a huge year for elections globally, uh, and I wanted to ask all of you to help us think through what trust might mean um, in these election cycles, either vis-a-vis -vis AI or various sorts of information systems. And Irene, I don't know if you want to kick us off. I used to work in U.S. election security prior to doing generative AI system work, and um... Part of part of how I'm thinking and I shared with the panel earlier is around what are systemic issues around elections. So having worked on elections, a big a big problem. And this is not at all to shift responsibility away from tech companies um, and AI deployers. It there's an additional complication to the landscape, but uh, it's a question of how do we resource, for example, voter ID laws and what how that looks different. This is I just looking particularly at my expertise in the US, this just looks really different state by state. There's a reason that we have distributed elections in the US. And there's a lot of ways that particularly marginalized communities are straight up prevented um, from being able to go to the polls. Uh, in addition to what are, what should the, the um, how do we view the complications that come with a lot of the issues around AI are quite similar to the disinformation that we had around Photoshop and around just people making up information. But the difference is it's a lower barrier to create this information and it's just like super realistic. Um, so I really wanna emphasize not to over rely on technical sil silver bullets such as contact providence and watermarking, which is not in a robust position to deploy. Um, in a in a meaningful way right now, but to have this whole of community approach, including labeling, ensuring that uh, the distribution of, for example, AI generated content is is fact checked, is stopped uh, before really disseminating to a place where it can affect people's uh, ability to go to the polls or or their information. Um, but but happy to elaborate more and excited to hear what my co panelists have to say. Kelsey? Yeah, so um, I think kind of coming from the kind of news information space a lot, which has kind of broadened me up to kind of thinking about information and systems generally, um, I think, especially around elections, um, I think there is this, this thing that happens, right, um, where people are like, oh, no, we forgot about people of color. Oh, no, we forgot about perspectives of women. So there's this like, um, short-term parachuting <laughs> that sort of happens um, where people are coming in, you're asked to kind of find one voice to be representative of a lot of people. And somehow that is building trust. And I think specifically when thinking about election information um, and thinking about kind of what are places and sources that people are going to trust during the election, which is something I think I'm thinking about at least, right? Um, I think it's really about making that investment before you get to this point, right? So it's really about community building and community engagement. Again, not in the sense of just going into a community, asking a couple of questions and leaving, but really it's about a long-term investment, right? In investing in what are the things that are going to build trust around the information we're giving out, the reporting, the systems we're using to report on elections. And i think if you have not done that by this point, I think it is hard to build that trust, right? Um, and I think that is what I'm thinking about. Like, these are systems that need to be sustained and not only thought about every four to six years or whatever when they're, when people are like, oh, elections again, right? Um, because I think the places that people are going to trust are the 
systems and places that have already been proving themselves trustworthy and put in the work and the effort to build trust within those communities. Which again takes out us out of, as Irene is saying, the, the narrow technical solution. That is not a technical solution. That's an infrastructural one. Then that could raise questions about how those sources of trustworthy news are being supported or eroded in the current moment. Jason, yeah. do you want to? I mean, I, I, Irene and Chelsea know a lot more about this than I do. So I really, um, I appreciate their being here. I defer to what they're saying. Um, I think that, so on the deep fakes issue, this point about there not being a simple technical solution, I think is is both true and also, you know, really worrying um, where it seems like we get to a spot where knowing about the provenance of images and information becomes all the more important. And so that trust relationship between the consumer of the information and the source um, becomes much, much more important because when you see an image, you can't tell uh, just from the image itself. You see a photograph, you can't tell from the photograph itself what its provenance is, what its origins are, whether or not it what its causal history is. And so you need to rely on the person or the institution that is um, affording you access to this information or to this image. Um, and so that trust relationship between people and institutions becomes all the more important in particular journalistic institutions. And I think that you know the, the crisis in journalism right now where all of these um, you know, really important, especially local news sources are drying up and um, are um, insolvent. Um, exactly the time where we need journalists the most um, because we rely so much more on um, trusting the source of information. Um, this is the time in which it's hardest to be a journalist, hardest to make a living as a journalist. Um, and that's extremely worrying. We need to start thinking about new models of funding journalism and um, supporting journalism, um, you know, maybe through public institutions. Okay, yay, getting lots of hearts on that. Thank you. We have a robust set of questions in the Q&A. Um, I think I'm going to go a little bit backwards as some of these questions have to do with exactly what we've been talking about. Um, so I'm going to move around a, li a little bit. But um, one question that, that I have here is um, a really interesting one. At, at, it's from Manali Agarwal, it, it reads, the current conversation is relevant to a question I have. I am wondering if the panelists could speak on what they see as important barriers to trust that move beyond lack of representation in technology and data. In other words, what trust issues would we be grappling with if and when technologies do become representative of historically marginalized groups? I wonder if you have an opinion on that question. So, so thinking about uh, this kind of uh, alignment area or, or this type of safety area of AI, the answer is that it, it's there is no one solution. It's a process. And I don't think enough people view it as such because our society is evolving. And what we found, not even just representative, but even like acceptable to say, I've been rewatching a lot of like early 2000s reality TV, which is not, should not be a representative of society. But like the things that people were just allowed to say, for example, um, and the way that, that we engage with communities should be evolving the way that we uh, find means of participatory design is like that research is constantly evolving and some concerns that I have is um, around what appropriate compensation looks like for human feedbackers um, what that should look like to be standardized not just you know in the U.S. but broadly as a lot of work is outsourced and as well as um, I mean this is a question of like what is this is my question who who represents it I really appreciate Jason's point on you know the loudest people should not always be the people who are in the room, um, who should be listened to, which is as well as what I was saying about, you know, in broadening your net with who, who you work with um, and bringing in people who maybe don't have like a very big Twitter following, but brilliant, brilliant brains. Yeah, and as I think this, or Chelsea, do you wanna come in there or should I move to another question? No, I was just going to say, I, I'm I'm thinking about this and I think 
I'm struggling only because I'm, I'm going back to what we we're talking about before, right. In terms of like, what does it mean that we will hit a point where we're all represented like that? That is the point that I think my mind is a little stuck on because I don't know what that point looks like, because I think going back to the idea that somehow if we just get a, a model of all different, like what we would think of like a broad uh, generalization of a community looks like, does that still mean we're all represented, right? So I think it kind of, again, goes back to what Irene said, it's a process. It's a process of calling people in, of working with different people to even, I don't even know if that's a point we can reach, right? Because it is this continual process, right? Of really understanding what do these different facets of these community look like, need, and how do we get at the nuances of that really, right? Um, so I, I think that's kind of what I'm thinking about in that question. Like, is, is that a, a thing that we think we can achieve or we strive for? Or is it, I think, this continual process that we have to kind of engage in kind of in a very nuanced way that we are far from, but we'll have to continue to iterate and progress? Yeah, I think it's also it's a really good question and one that um, I would have to think about quite a bit more. But um, one so even after the point at which we so we arrive at a uh, at a situation where we have you know good representation of people of color we've got good representation of women we have a good representation of sexual minorities um there there still is this kind of conflict between corporate power and civil society and you might still you know rightly ask you know whose interests are being served by these technologies. Um, and you know, even when on the corporate board you have people of different colors and different genders, um, there's still the question of like, are the interests of civil society really being represented um, by these technologies? And what role are these technologies playing in our democracy? Um, and so it's it's not just, a, I mean, the question of representation, I think, is a lot broader, which is really the point that Chelsea was just making. Yeah, and I think that relates to a que an anonymous question um, along those lines. So I'll read out the question. I am working in the field of ethnic ethical technology. And to be honest, I am feeling a bit tired at the moment as we have been talking for a while now about what is not working, but what is the next step? How do we go ahead, ahead to change the system when the technology infrastructure is owned entirely by tech giants? Yes, sure, we can build an app that can understand different accents or build more trust by having more representation in data, but by simply existing, even though the app or data is helping people, they are also reliant on cloud storage, computational power, all owned by big tech companies. Asking from a genuine place of curiosity, what do conversations like the, these, what are they contributing to? Yeah, so I mean, there's a, the big question of like the role of capitalism in all this. Um, and then, and but then there's also, you know, smaller scale um, wins and solutions that we can still talk about. And we can, you know, it's not always, you know, uh, evil uh, corporations against um, uh, virtuous civil society. There's sometimes, you know, partnerships that, that, are, that are really interesting. So on the one example I was talking before on voice recognition and there being a lack of representation of African-American voices in the data set, um, there is a really interesting partnership with between Google and um, Howard University on collecting um, voice data from African-Americans. And part of the way in which they're building trust is to have the data stored and owned by Howard University and not by Google. Um, and so, you know, that's it's, that's not overturning capitalism, but I think it is kind of like incremental progress um, that we can laud and see as a kind of a model for, for yeah, improvement. Irene, do you want to add here from your perspective? Well, I mean, coming from more uh, of an open science community platform, a huge point of what, what we're doing at Hugging Face is listening to people first and having, I mean, this, like we would be truly nothing without the Hugging Face community. I really, I really appreciate Jason's example. I hope we see more of that um, and understand that people often know what works best for them, um, but also recognizing that not everybody is going to have, for example, all of the deep language model skills to understand that system. So part of why I started working around um, 
the, the type of AI that I work on is, for example, increasing um, accessibility. So better user interfaces, better ways for people to be able to give feedback to systems and ensure that the outputs that they look for are, are reflective of their needs. But I appreciate this anonymous question looking at, you know, what is the infrastructure and what we're building on? So to think about like, what is Hugging Faces business model? It's a kind of freemium GitHub-like business model. A lot of that's based off of compute. And there are, there is, there are very few companies that have the capacity to, to have the cost of these incredibly expensive centers. Um, so something that we're really excited about is at least in the US side, the National AI Research Resource, we hope that it will be very well resourced. We hope that in the future, there will be more democratization of infrastructure, including compute, but also recognizing that these types of infrastructure are just really tangible. I often wonder if we talk too much about compute because like it's so quantifiable, but there is a huge wealth gap in what people are able to access as well. Chelsea, do you wanna come in? Yeah, I mean, I think I would kind of just echo and plus one kind of what Jason was saying before, right? I think um, that, you know, capitalism, late stage capitalism, it is an overwhelming thing in this field, but I think it can feel exhausting if we think about like, kind of the broader implications of it. But I also think that what I, at least what I try to do, right, is kind of focus on kind of these little connections, these little moments of people trying to subvert it. And does that mean it's going to subvert capitalism as a whole or kind of the corporate structure in which kind of tech corporations have formed? Probably not. Um, but does that mean it's not making an impact to certain people or certain communities who are then seeing pathways to having those trusted places or seeing pathways to having an available avenue where they can feel they can trust the information? Um, and so I think that's how I've been able to kind of approach it um, without feeling kind of overwhelmed kind of by the broader systemic issue and thinking are like, again, what are these smaller things that people are doing that can at least start to kind of foster those helpful avenues? Right. And those pathways may not always be pathways towards inclusion in the status quo. They may actually be pointing to alternatives. So that's maybe how I would push that question a little bit. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions. So one question from Anna Skorupa is really about public trust as a good. And the question is, um, some of your collective, our collective remarks seem to speak to the benefits of distrust for some folks in some situations, e.g. critical engagement with sources of information. How do you think about whether public trust is an absolute good or something always to be pursued? Really good question. I mean, I think, so we often get in the frame of like, you know, what our goal is, is just to increase trust. <laughs> um, and what we really want is pairing between trust and trustworthiness, right? We want trust in trustworthy people, trust in trustworthy sources, trust in trustworthy systems. And then we, and it's healthy to have skepticism and distrust as well, especially when um, systems are untrustworthy or exploitative. Um, so to, like, to have this kind of mindset where you're always asking, you know, what data about me is being collected? What is this data being used for? Whose interests does this application serve? Those are really important questions that you know are part should be part of public education, really, um, where um, you know kids grow up asking these questions um, and cultivating this kind of skeptical um, orientation um, towards technology applications. I think that's also that's part of being a vibrant democracy. Irene, where do you come down on this question of whether trust is a good to be pursued, a public good? In a lot of research conversations, people tend to have strong feelings about words. Um, and trust means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, so I, I really like that yeah, pairing between trust and trustworthiness is very well said. And when I think about it, I mean, it's just easy to get overwhelmed in AI world, especially with the speed of it. So I, I think it's really helpful to think about context. So when we think about 
think a lot about elections. I have a lot of election anxiety. I'm sure you're not alone here. Public trust is so critical in elections, in, in believing the results. We've seen what happens when public trust is not there. I sheltered in place. I was very scary um, in DC that day. Uh, so, so it's a question of like public trust among whom and also recognizing institutions are made of people um, and people have that responsibility. And I, and coming, coming from industry, like I hope that I take that responsibility. I, I think that I do. Um, and I, I am very encouraged by discourse cross sectors. So I just like the existence, for example, of these types of conversations are very heartening to me. And maybe Irene, well, while you have the mic, a question here, I think is directed towards, towards your experiences from Bogdana Rakova. Um, in your experience, what are the organizational teams and roles within industry who own and are accountable for building and repairing trust relationships? How is that operationalized? Well, Bogdana does incredible work herself. Um, so uh, I'll, I would love to hear what she has to say as well. Um, so, so not just not just within industry, but broadly, it's really easy. So it's easy to say like everybody is responsible for safety and then that can diffuse responsibility as opposed to having somebody accountable. Um, and something that we do at Hugging Face that Dr. Meg Mitchell, our chief ethics scientist has, has really pioneered is having a, um, a kind of, it's not really a hub and spoke, but a means for everybody to be able to contribute to ethics, everybody from around the company, we see Microsoft do this as well, um, to be part of the conversation, to sync, and then also bring those lessons back to their respective team, their respective work, and make sure that we also have visibility, especially in a very remote world where people are more comfortable working hybrid or remote to ensure that lessons are shared among people. So yes, accountability is key, but also being able to tailor tasks for specific work streams. Okay, and maybe a really big question can take us to the end of the session um, from my colleague, Robin Kaplan. When is trust no longer a helpful frame? In light of what Chelsea has pointed out that you don't have to trust a system in order to use it, what does it mean when we are asking people to trust AI systems that they might be dependent on anyway? Does trust even matter? Small question. I want to say, um, I think this is a, a great question from Robin. Um, and I I think my gut inclination is, is, I'm tempted to say it still does, right? Um, because even if we are using systems that we don't necessarily trust, the amount to which we are able to kind of use those systems for our own needs, for our own ends, I think are still going to be in some ways filtered through the whether or not we trust them, right? Um, and so even if I feel like I don't have a trustworthy source of news and I go to ones I don't trust. Think of what I could use to advocate for myself if I had a trustworthy source, right? Like, I think that's the kind of way I'm thinking about it, that it's still a filter, right? In terms of what people are going to do with those systems or react to them um, or even use them to empower themselves, right? Um, and so I think that's why my gut inclination is to still say yes. Um, but I don't know. I think it's I think it's a really great and a really hard question to grapple with. Yeah, I worry about this sometimes, but my gut is also to say yes. And um maybe part of the reason for that is that it seems like we want to distinguish between healthy skepticism and a critical spirit and being conspiracy minded. Um and being conspiratorial is really um it diminishes your agency, it diminishes your autonomy. Um, and so it's really important, you know, not to fall into that um, while you're trying to cultivate this kind of healthy skepticism. And so that is a matter of calibrating trust well. And so I think it's still important to, to talk about how to do that and how to cultivate those um, sort of 
virtues, intellectual and otherwise, um, to, to, to trust well. So I, I want to ensure that we're not viewing trust as a binary where you can either have it or you don't. Um, and I really, this, I've been thinking a lot about like healthy skepticism and what is the level of trust that you're willing to have to Chelsea's earlier point about like, at what point are you willing or not willing to, to engage with the system? And this is where um, like, I, you're getting a lot of insight into Irene's personal life. Like I'm on Instagram a lot as a pretty educated person about everything around data privacy and like body dysmorphia. Um, but like, there, there's a trade-off with the convenience, with the availability, with with the what what with what I get out of it, um, and I think that's like some what people know for themselves, what they what is the level of trust that they need to have, in addition to what are some mechanisms from the deployer side that need to be built that incrementally add to trust among the user, which is some some work that was conducted from my colleagues back when I was at OpenAI, is that there are specific trust mechanisms that we can put, including, I mean, now in the AI era with labeling, that is a mechanism, but it doesn't make this like 100% a trustworthy AI output. Amazing answers. And I think we are at time. So I just want to end uh, by thanking my amazing panelists, Irene Suleiman, Chelsea Peterson, Saluddin, and Jason DeCruz. I appreciate you being with us today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.